And last but not least, here is the final interview I have with you guys about Path of Fire. There are some big names on this one. Those of you who watched the post show will have already heard snippets of this as I discussed various things with the current game director, Mike O'Brien. But joining him are a few guys that work on story and narrative. And of course, I've got a lot to ask them about how the expansion is going. Same theme, let's draw comparisons between Guild Wars 2 of today and Path of Fire and where Guild Wars 2 has been in the past. Hope you guys enjoyed. Enjoy. We're back, last interview of the day. We've got some big guys talking about big topics. We're talking about Path of Fire. Uh, specifically, we can hopefully talk a bit about the story and so forth. Uh, so I'm going to introduce you to a few people, and they're going to talk a bit about who they are, what they do. So let's do it. This is Scott McGough. I'm the narrative lead for Path of Fire. Uh, my name is Matthew Medina. I am the story design team lead for Path of Fire. And my name is Mike O'Brien. I'm the game director. Let's talk a little bit about narrative direction. Um, and let's talk about how hard it is to scope a uh, narrative of today. Because as we know, uh, amazingly, Path of Fire has been worked on in tandem with season three of The Living World, which is very cool. But that means that way back at the start of Living World season three, you guys needed to know where you were going already. Storytelling is a balance of preparing things in advance and also letting figuring out what's working and developing things organically on the fly. How's that been in recent years for Guild Wars 2 to pull off something that amazing? It's, it's been a real challenge, uh, but a very rewarding one. Uh, since the Living World concept launched, we've had this pattern of Living World will carry the baton to a certain point, a conclusion, then hand the baton to the expansion, who carries it a bit further to another conclusion, then we hand the baton back to Living World. So you're correct in that we did know where the story was going, but we didn't know exactly how it was going to get there. So while we were working on expansion and Living World was working on episodes that were going to come out before expansion, we had to work in pretty close concert to make sure that they were setting up the storylines we needed to set up. They were introducing the characters and the character beats we knew we were going to explore. And they were tackling the antagonist who we knew was going to be our challenge in the expansion. Mm. Matthew, you've, you've talked a little bit in the past online about Heart of Thorns in terms of uh, what it did and its scope as, as, a, as a part of the story. Now, how have you taken those experiences? How have you looked at Heart of Thorns? What do, what do you think you managed to learn from that when you came to Path of Fire? Yeah, so one of the chief things I think we learned from Heart of Thorns was that uh, we really needed to focus on continuing to build a rich and deep story and focus very solidly on quality and bringing the gameplay experience to the fore. So instead of having big moments that happen only in cinematics, we really tried to figure out how to bring those epic moments into the game itself uh, so that you're a participant in it and you feel like you're just playing the story and, and not necessarily just watching it. We still have some amazing cinematics um, and our cinematics team is awesome. We are trying very hard to make sure that everything in the story that happens that's big is something that you feel like you're a part of. We, we continue to build on the on that stuff. Um, it's It's been a lot less focused on uh, adding new pieces of tech to our story content and more just continuing to drill down on like what makes an amazing story instance. So for example, Heart of Thorns had some pretty cool uh, boss battles, but we've really focused again on taking the things that we've learned, even from outside the team, from raids, from fractals, uh, the boss design, the skill design, all of that stuff, where we're bringing more of that element in so that these uh, encounters and the, the story all feel like everything is turned up to 11 and we just continue to build amazing content. Changing the tune a little bit, uh, Mo, around the time of Heart of Thorns, we saw that the devs had to go away to get it out the door and then go away to get Living World Season 3 going. Um, can we expect more of that? And if not, why not? It is kind of the challenge we've set for ourselves with Path of Fire. You know, um, Heart of Thorns, if there's one thing we wish we could have done, it's go straight from Heart of Thorns into Living World Season 3. Absolutely. And Heart of Thorns was such a good setup. I mean, it really put us in a good position to be able to deliver great, um, you know, great endgame content into the game. Um, the work we did, you know, even in the lead up to Heart of Thorns, right? Like mega servers, people don't give credit for uh, how important mega servers is to the game, that we can add as much you know, as much new landmass as we want, as many new open world zones as we want, and we're not gonna spread the player base out because we can keep all those maps populated. And since then, we've just gone crazy, right? We, we introduced six new open world zones in six episodes in Living World Season 3. We kind of set ourselves this challenge of, uh, you know, 
we've hit a really good stride, um, I think, with the Living World episodes. Uh, and we get to make an expansion pack that is all about content. And it's kind of like, you know, we've got the systems in place, we know what we're doing, we just get to make, you know, the content that we always wanted to see. Go to the most interesting places and kind of tell, um, you know, tell the deep story, kind of answering questions that players have wanted and we've wanted to answer for a long time. Uh, and so it's about how do you tie those together? How do you make it seamless to go right from Living World into Path of Fire and then right into the premiere of Living World again? Do you think do you think that's a challenge you've cracked? Is it stressful? Are you, are you guys like a duck? You look very smooth and calm above the surface, but underneath it's going crazy? I think it's absolutely crazy town. If you're going to ask me, like, is it a normal thing to do or is it crazy to like, uh, you know, to plan 18 months ago um, how these episodes are going to intertwine into each other, but know that, you know, episode six needs to lead straight into uh, an expansion and needs to hit at the right time and, you know, needs to tell the right story. Yeah, it's a huge amount of work. Uh, we have definitely been heads down for, you know, the last year trying to build up this content. But, you know, we've got great teams who are super professional at doing this. We have been doing it. We know how to make great content. It's what we love. It's what we do. And we're doing it. That's cool. Uh, change of choose again. In terms of narrative, okay, um, how do you decide what, with, with such a large universe, with so much information to pass, how do you decide what is deserving of having its story explored? And how do you decide what of those becomes expansion quality storytelling versus living world? Our game has always been about the confrontation with the Elder Dragons. Mm. Uh, we started with the first, in the core version of the game, you fought Zaitan. Uh, in the first expansion, you fought Mordremoth. And we knew we wanted to keep the story fresh and interesting uh, without diverging too far from that main focus, that main goal. And so one of the ways we chose to complexify or make the story a little bit more layered, a little bit more nuanced, was to introduce this twist where suddenly we've killed two Elder Dragons and it turned out to be not the best idea in the world. It was a short-term solution. In the long term, it created as many problems as it solved. Mm -hmm. And so now we have to sort of take a step back. It's not as simple as go find a dragon, go kill a dragon. We need to take a slightly bigger view of how we're handling that going forward. And that allowed us to introduce uh, Balthazar as the antagonist. He is still determined to kill an Elder Dragon for his own reasons. And those reasons are explored in Path of Fire. You will find out why Balthazar is doing what he's doing, but we don't know yet. And so the idea that it's not as simple as killing an Elder Dragon and we can't let this other very powerful entity kill another Elder Dragon or there will be terrible, terrible consequences, that allowed us to explore a more subtle and a more nuanced story than the straightforward, let's go kill a dragon. And so that was one of our guiding principles. We wanted to make sure that we didn't fall into a pattern or a formula where every expansion is about, let's go kill another Elder Dragon. There's six, that means six expansions. It becomes predictable. And we like to keep things fresh and we have a lot of really creative people who work here who think of really interesting ways to approach that kind of problem. And so after a long discussion, we hit on the idea of Balthazar as the antagonist as this change hits our thinking that we can't just kill other dragons. And once we established that, Living World knew they needed to set up who Balthazar was and what he was doing uh, in, the open, in, in the Living World Season 3. And that would lead into us directly confronting Balthazar in the expansion. So that was one of the ways we decided what, how do we draw the line between Living World and expansion. Um, there's a lot of cross-pollination that goes on back and forth between those two projects. And it takes a lot of discussions with the various teams to, okay, Living World Episode 1 will handle this aspect, and that'll feed into the next aspect. And when we get to the end, they would then pass it off to the expansion, and we will take it into the final direction where we wanted it to go. Uh, a general question that I'd like everyone to answer, really. We'll go this way around the room. Uh, generally speaking, what's one big lesson you feel you learned, perhaps in 2012, perhaps with Heart of Thorns, that has fed into Path of Fire being hopefully the best product ArenaNet has put out? For me, uh, the way I would answer this would be, um, I think we have learned a tremendous amount about how to build and structure story instances. Um, if you go back to 2012 and you, and you go through your personal story, a lot of them were very, very, very basic. Um, go in, there's a small instance boundary, you have a fight, you're done. The fight isn't necessarily all that you know, complicated or, or even interesting in some cases. We just, we had a lot of story instances uh, that, um, you know, they, they served the need that they, that they had, but we have just continued to take that and build upon them so that now 
we spend an enormous amount of time on every instance. Uh, you know, there's a lot of iteration going back and forth. We have a lot of play tests. We have a lot of feedback. And we're constantly trying to push the envelope on what we can do to make story in our game a really awesome central component to the player's experience. Yeah, sure. I think a lot about a lot of this is um, putting ourselves in a position to take time to do it right. Yeah. You know, uh, Guild Wars Two. Guild Wars Two was always the game where um, it's about players coming together to do things in the world. And so, for, right from the beginning, we wanted the world to be a changing place, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, in in season one, um, we had stuff going on all the time in the world. And some of those things, you know, you can do small things in the world and you can just do them. And some things to do it right, you're really gonna take some time to do it right. Mm -hmm. You talk a lot uh, in a lot of your videos, you'll talk about like, you know, the Zaitan fight and what you wished of the Zaitan fight. Cause that's a fight that a team would take six months to do right, right? Um, and when we need to do a fight like that right, we can have a team take six months to do it right. With season three, like you've kind of seen the path that we've laid down with season three. Like we, we start season three um, understanding and realizing that now we can just go make, you know, new open world zones and we can really deeply kind of intertwine the story we're telling to the places we're going in the world. Uh, but then we start it with um, a real determination um, at the beginning of season three that we're going to do this right. Like when we come out with an episode, it is going to be rich, deep storytelling and a really detailed, um, you know, map. And that's what we want to ship. And so, uh, so we take the time. So we kind of, you know, changed the pace and said like, no, you know, we're going to change the world, but we're not going to change the world constantly. We're going to change the world when we can do it right. Um, and I think we've had a really nice pace that's allowed us to do really high quality storytelling uh, in season three and now through an expansion pack where we got to make a whole expansion pack just about content. And I think one of the lessons we learned versus uh, the launch version of the game and uh, Heart of Thorns was to have a smaller cast of characters that we spend more time with. Uh, I like all of our characters, but I, I'm willing to admit in Heart of Thorns, they were all on screen for most of it and we didn't get to spend enough quality time with all of them. So in Path of Fire, we sort of made very strategic choices. Who are the characters who are gonna accompany you and what are they gonna contribute to the story? Their character arcs tie into the main plot line and the player's character arc. And I think it's a much more effective a focused form of storytelling because there are fewer things on screen that people have to pay attention to. And also to circle back to the question, uh, how do you make an Elder Dragon an interesting antagonist? Uh, it's a challenge. They are these large scale, almost cosmic level uh, antagonists and they've been described as earthquakes or hurricanes. They're sort of forces of nature and it's hard to put a face on a force of nature. And so I think one of the ways we address that was to introduce Balthazar to the mix who is a much more, he's got a human face and a human voice and he can, he can he can talk about what his motivations are. He can show you what his motivations are through his actions. Just, just a quick note, we've got about five, six minutes left. Okay, all right, well, I had some questions about uh, being the game director. Sure. Um, so when you became game director, we saw some changes in communication policy. And um, I'm always very perplexed when I see people uh, on the internet, because in a lot of ways, I feel like we get good information at a reasonable pace now with regular AMAs and stuff. Um, What's led to the communication policy you have as game director uh, for Guild Wars 2? You know, you've just blown the community away by revealing this huge thing that's going to come way quicker than most people think. Do you think they're finally going to see the fruits of having less communication and until, you know, the moment's right on their doorstep? You know, I kind of said at the beginning that I think uh, that is at the beginning of uh, taking on this role that I think the game needs to speak for itself. Ultimately, uh, you're either delighted when you play the game or you're not delighted when you play the game. And so all our focus should be on making it an amazing game that you enjoy and not on like hyping it and telling you it's going to be, you know, you're going to love this. Like, no, just just make it amazing and show it and let players love it. And in order to do that, we have, uh, as I said, we've kind of taken this very deliberate pace of like, we're going to make sure something is you know, we're gonna make sure we're really proud of things before we ship them. And so we took each episode to the point where it was done um, and we were proud of it. And then we announced it and shipped it. Yeah, that's a, that's a change in communication because uh, we could be saying the entire time, like, well, we hope we can do this and we hope we can do that. And some of them are gonna work out and some of them aren't gonna work out. Like that's life, right? Not everything works out. Um, I hope that people are already seeing the fruits. Like I hope that people um, through season three, I hope our players um, have recognized that um, yeah, we're not talking constantly, but when we are, uh, we're 
announcing, you know, some really high quality work, some really good work that, you know, they're going to love when they get to play the game. And, uh, and so here we are, right? Um, we've worked on this expansion pack. It's been, you know, 18 months of hard work to get to this point. Um, and we've got, you know, a very deep content rich expansion pack that is way farther along than, you know, players would expect or that ever would have been in the old method. You've talked a little on Reddit uh, as well about the importance of word of mouth advertising yeah. um, and the fact this is an MMO from 2012. Uh, do you want to dive into those thoughts a little bit more for people that will be listening now yeah. in terms of Path of Fire? I, I think word of mouth is, is super critical for, um, you know, for any online world, but especially, you know, Guild Wars 2 is it's a five-year-old game now, right? And so, you know, players always ask us, you know, you should do more, should you do more TV advertising or more advertising here or there or the other place? And uh, well, you know, to convince somebody who made a no buy decision five years ago um, to make a buy decision today, like, is that what's gonna get them into the game? I don't think that's how the world works. I don't think, you know, uh, in general, that's probably not how, the, not how the world works, but especially for a game like Guild Wars 2. Players are going to play the game because their friends are telling them it's a good game. Their friends are saying, I played this content, it was great content. Um, I, I think our fans are kind of our advocates, you know. Um, they're out there telling the world whether we're doing a good job or we're not doing a good job. If we're doing a good job, then I think people should, you know, be willing to say, yeah, Guild Wars 2 has, you know, has had a great season. I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed this expansion pack. You know, you should come play. Join me in this game. And that's how we win customers. I'll end up with slightly fluffier question again for you, May. It's interesting, when you stepped up as game director, it seemed like it was going to be a transitionary thing. It wasn't necessarily going to be for very long. Here we are well over a year later. Uh, how are you feeling about the role? Do we, do we have you for a while? So first of all, um, I've loved doing this role. Uh, you know, this, uh, first of all, I love being, um, you know, very directly on the game, and I feel like um, I feel like the role of a game director is really to champion the players of the game, uh, and really the role of the studio head is to get the whole company uh, oriented around doing what's right for the players. Right? Like we build these games for the players, right? So we're always going to do what's right, and so uh, it creates a very direct kind of bond, I think, between the game team and the rest of the company to say whatever we need. You know, to do this right, we're going to do it. You know, and if we need to, uh, you know, if we need to take more time on this, we're going to take more time on this. Uh, you know, if we need to change this, you know, change the way we're doing things, change this way we communicate, change anything, you know, to be right for the players, mm -hmm. we're going to do it. Uh, the whole company was always behind it, but obviously, you know, it kind of cuts and clarifies. Um, and yeah, um, I love working with the teams. I've loved working with the live team. I love working with the XPAC2 team. Uh, we're doing really great work together, and I'm super proud of the teams. Uh, and do you have me forever? You probably can't have me forever. <laughs> uh, I would love to, but uh, I do need to work on other things also. Uh, running a company is also its own thing, right? Um, however, um, we've had so I don't know um, that the community is recognizing yet, but is going to start to recognize that uh, uh, Z, Mike Z and I have been working together really closely and well on a lot of this. Uh, you didn't get to meet Z today, and I would love for you to meet Z. Uh, but anyway, yeah, uh, he and I are really kind of um, have been more and more doing this together, and more and more I want to get him um, into this role and more publicly facing also. Okay, well, yeah, so thank you very much, guys. I think we're about the end of our interview time. And uh, I'll see you next time.